Hello, Dr. Zoe. Hello, it's lovely to be here. It's been a, a busy day today. It was such a good day, isn't it, in the calendar? I imagine you're the woman of the hour. You've all day you've been blasting around. It's World Menopause Day. How have you spent it? We so through the clinics so I work for Newsom Health Menopause and Wellbeing Clinic, and we're often asked to do talks to various companies, which is fantastic. So I've spent the morning with Greater Manchester Police, which is lovely because they're in the area, and then I had a talk with Nuclear Fuels this afternoon, and now with your good self. Oh, fantastic! And with these digital talks, so you actually went to the companies. They're digital talks because I think we've all embraced Zoom, haven't we, since the pandemic, which has 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 widened the scope, I think, because it, it means that we can fit a lot more into the day. It was some weeks ago, I was listening to you, um, one of your appearances with Liz Earle, and I literally nearly hurt myself falling off my chair when you started to talk about the female hormone that is testosterone. Yes. Uh, uh, Flip, I did not know. Tell me, when did you discover that, oh my word, you didn't learn this in medical school, did you? No, so I, I well, in 10 years of training as a GP, where I only had two hours of training on HRT and testosterone was never mentioned. And the first time I really came across it was, it was actually a patient that was up and running on HRT and she brought an article in and said, I think I would benefit from testosterone probably about seven years ago and I'm ashamed to say I was actually quite cross with her because I just thought why are you asking me to do something that is must clearly be dangerous I've never been taught about this it's so far out of my comfort zone and so I ended up referring her to the endocrinology service at the time and and then I, I didn't see her again I have to say and then testosterone only started to come up on the radar again when I was doing my menopause training and again, in the NICE guidelines, which are the UK guidelines for clinicians, it just mentions libido. And I thought, well, sex drive is really important. So if there's something that can help with that, then why isn't this more available? And then when I started specializing in menopause and just doing menopause and seeing the results when women were treated with testosterone and brought back into female range, and that's important. And you see their brains come back and you see their confidence come back and you see their energy come back. And of course the libido, but it's the brains that just fascinates me. We produce more testosterone than estrogen in our ovaries until menopause. Take yes. me through the science of that and what testosterone is and where the receptors are, you know, how important a hormone is this and why have, has it been almost captured only by the male fraternity? I, I, I don't know. Is, and I, I, I think to some extent you don't want to explore too much further because I think it, it almost feels quite dark. So you have testosterone receptors throughout your body. And I think it's for some reason and I don't know whether this is a historical thing that, that women are not expected to want those qualities of strength, of sharpness, of sex drive, that it's been forgotten about as a, a well, we don't, we don't want those qualities because that's not feminine. So it's been viewed, hasn't it, that testosterone is the male hormone and estrogen the female hormone. And as you said, so premenopausally, the ovaries produce three to four times more testosterone than estrogen. Then it does a sort of a steady, as in males and females, it does a steady decline down. And by the time you're 50, very often you're running at half, which explains, and I think as well, a lot of women at this time can, can attribute those, the fatigue and all those things because life is busy. So you think, well, it's natural because everybody around me is the same. Mm. And the, this is the thing, is the, the worst thing is watching all of these amazing women get quieter and quieter and fade away from their jobs. Yeah, one in four. And yes. I'm sure I'm sure that was at last count because I'm sure it's still happening because I watched myself fade. I mean, you just, there is, it's almost like you're in a car crash and nobody knows the cause of it and they'll mm. never be able to tell you. So you have to advocate, research, make the time to figure it all out on your own. But the testosterone story I mean, this at medical school, 
if I lined up five or ten GPs, chances are only one or two would know that it's yeah, also the it female hormone? Many. Seriously. I don't think it would be that high. Well, I mean, we know Aristotle used to call women the, a mutilation of men. We know down through the ages, medical research, women have been the frail sex. We don't want to mess with their hormones because it's all about reproduction. And then once they've had the menopause, menopause, um, you know, they're, they're no longer reproductive. So they're just going to be do the grandmother role. Mm -hmm. So now that we're living longer, we can look forward to 70s, 80s, perhaps even longer, we really deserve to be replacing testosterone alongside estrogen and progesterone. It's a huge mess. And this is what started my little project at the beginning of the year. So in the UK, each area has a prescribing formulary and that guides what the, the, the GP is prescribing. So if you if a medication comes up that you're not familiar with, you will very often look at the formulary to see whether it is mentioned in your area. And there are over 140 in the UK. And I thought, well, I'll just see where testosterone is on the radar. And it was it was such a shock. I mean, I knew the situation wasn't likely to be good, but this was appalling so just going through these areas and thinking testosterone isn't even mentioned never mind how to access it it's just not there it's a black hole it's again yes. in medical education it's one of those black holes that I, it sounds to me like you know it's medical research sexism um, the patriarchy's always been in charge and i'm not man bashing but it's just you know, we even look, remember that app just a few months ago, or was it last year, Babylon? And mm -hmm. there was a big hue and cry because they did some research and the heart attack advice was completely yes. different for women because yes. the out, people were feeding in the information, men, and they knew that what the symptoms were for men, but they didn't realize at all that it mm -hmm. was different for women because the research hadn't been done on women. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it just, I mean, that when you start to look at it, a lot of there are so many, there's so much work to be done in menopause per se, but this, it gets women functioning again. And we know there are so many younger women out there as well who are going into menopause. And then you start being mislabeled with so many people that we see have got diagnoses, things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, ME, POTS, and then you replace their testosterone and a lot of these symptoms will disappear. So right now we have very little take up in this country of HRT, the body identical mm -hmm. plant-based HRT. Um, just to lay in some background, I had menopause when I was in living in Switzerland and I was, as I said, it was, it wasn't just a car crash. It was a, I felt like I was rolled over by a juggernaut. Mm -hmm. I had insomnia and off the charts anxiety. I used to love race car driving, going across to Germany, over to Germany and, you know, driving on the Autobahn really fast. Mm -hmm. And I could not summon up the courage to go on motorways when they were dead. Mm -hmm. I was so anxious mm -hmm. and I became so bitchy and difficult and people breathing around me bothered me. Yes. And I was, I mean, do you, does that resonate with you too? I mean, it's literally- a fairly I was, common symptom. Yeah, marching around like a lunatic and my fuse was so short and I was in a new job and I was responsible for four hours a day of, you know, quite high stress live radio. And I don't know, all my colleagues just must have thought she wolf, she devil, um, because I was so snappish. I was so difficult and I, I could hear myself being that way. And yes, I, I can summon a sharp tongue all through my life. I've been able to do that. But this was, was, it was involuntary. So I was just really, really difficult. So when I went to get, I won't bother you with the autoimmune attacks I had, but I had some of those. And then when I went to my gynecologist, she just said, well, we're putting you on estrogel and utrogestin, the mm -hmm. body identicals, which are approved here in the UK. And just to cut to the chase, so she just said, everyone's on these. Every, every woman across Europe is on these. Well, when I came home to the UK three years later, I went to my GP and she said, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. I said, yeah, you do. And I brought her the nice guidelines because I anticipated this because I'd read around and realized that it was in, what is it, 12% or 14% yes. is the take yeah. up, appallingly low take up for plant-based 
hormone replacement mm -hmm. therapy here. Um, anyway, sorry to she she just said no 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 and I said yes you must you know mm -hmm. I'm not asking for anything off license anything strange and weird and woo woo this is being used all around the world and I really you can prescribe it for me and she did and she was interested in learning more about it so that's really mm -hmm. good but even just last week when I went to my GP having listened to you and Louise Newson, whose clinic you work at in Stratford-upon-Avon, um, she's been, the two of you have been leading this campaign to tell the, the I call it the testosterone reclamation story. Yes. And um, I went to get it and there was no way. And my GP is she absolutely can't. lovely. She, she, it wasn't so much that she wasn't confident. She didn't know yes. how much to give. And I sent her links for, for your website. I sent her a podcast that you were on. Um, you and Louise talking about it. So hopefully she will take that on board and change her mind. And hopefully it's not something within her formulary. But you were saying you looked at all the formularies and it's it's just not available for women, is it? It's changing. And this is why it's been such a big project, because there are so many facets to this. So as you say, the education is key. We need to normalize it that women know that it is their hormone it is a female hormone so that again there's a lot of a lot going on with word of mouth which is fantastic we need i mean the education side of things should really be starting from medical student right the way through it shouldn't be a new thing when you become a gp to suddenly learn about this but with every other condition things like diabetes for instance you're taught at medical school and then you're taught each year during your general practice training and you become familiar with it and you discuss cases and everybody in the practice knows about it. And, and what then, did you have, like two hours worth of a menopause of HRT. module of yeah, HRT, two it. hours on that? And was it was it the horse based urine HRT as part of the mix and the well, Women's is, Health Initiative and cancer and blood clots? And yes, it was because I'm showing my age now. It was just as the WHI trial came out. So it was really do not ever prescribe HRT. So then I spent many years trying not to prescribe HRT. And then the data has come through about the WHI and the, the many flaws in that trial. And also the change, as you say, to the new body identical HRT. It's very, very different from the synthetic HRT of yesteryear. And so there's a lot of work to do with that as well. There's still a lot of fear about it. There's still and I was a, a GP trainer, so I'm training the next generation. So if I don't have the knowledge, the general practice curriculum is vast. You can imagine it covers everything. So it's very easy in a finite number of training sessions to skirt over that. And you will still tick enough boxes with women's health to sign that trainee off. But it's the problem, it's like in advertising, you know, the ads that we see that are so annoying that never feature midlife women are written by mostly men. They're the survivors mm -hmm. in the ad industry. Is it is it the same? Because the people who draw up the curriculum, it's, it's mostly been a, a male profession. Are they the ones in charge of drawing up the medical school curriculum? Are there not enough women there who have roles that are are you know leadership roles I, th I think as you said it is just a black hole so it's only been since i have been prescribing this day in day out and being able to watch and it is again when you do your first few prescriptions i started prescribing it in general practice because i thought well this this is safe and i've got women working in the local supermarket who are really struggling with the cognitive side of things and we'll get them going on it. I will monitor them. I'll m monitor their blood tests to check that they stay in female range. And it is slow. And you do to begin with, when you prescribe it, you just think, crikey, um, am I doing the right thing? And then as you watch people coming back, you just think this is incredible. This, this, what is going on that this isn't being recognized? So the arguments that I've had back from, or discussions, I should say, from the CCGs and from healthcare professionals. CCGs. So that's the prescribing formulary board. Right. And so you go around in circles because they don't perceive a need because women don't know about it. So women aren't asking about it when they go to the, the clinics. They're not speaking to their GPs about it. So nobody knows. So there's this thing of 
not knowing what you don't know. So this is where we have to start. So the prescribing formula is at the moment it is off license. Well, I'm not having that as an argument because 15% of GP prescribing is off license. Doesn't mean it isn't safe. It just doesn't have a license for that use. So it's licensed for men, but not licensed for women yet. And um, Dr. Newson and I are working on that as well. And again, so that's one kickback. The preparations that are available are for men. So for example, one of the ones that has been approved by some formularies comes in little sachets and women have to use a tenth of a sachet. Right. The pharmacists are quite rightly saying, well, that's not great to be leaving half a sachet open somewhere. We've got the dosing problems and all of these things. And you think, well, yes, that's so move on again. And then a new product or a new preparation then has to go through the MHRA, which is a, a costly. And this is the regulator in the UK. So this is the regulator. Well, the, the drug companies initially were saying, well, why should I go to the effort of doing this? There isn't a market out there and there isn't a market because women don't know about it. Oh, they're really a sli the I mean, there's a lot of money that can be made here for any any pharmaceutical company that wants to come in. I mean, I would have thought, I mean, let's call it the company is Besan that makes the plant based estrogel and utrogestin, mm -hmm. both of these products. I would have thought they would be Johnny on the spot and come up with the third leg of the stool. Well, hopefully, hopefully, that's a meeting that I have in November um, with them. And, but again, I, you have to say to them, they, they may say, well, where's the market? And you say, well, there will be a market when we've done the work to get the word out there. But then we've still got the middle people, which, because I, I mean, I firmly believe this could be done by GPs. GPs are incredible. And they, yeah. when you look at what general practice manages, complex end of life care, complex renal failure, diabetes, mental health, yeah. And all testosterone needs when it's up and running is a yearly blood test. GPs are more than capable of doing that. And is the blood test a reliable, a reliable marker of the level? Because I'd read somewhere that saliva tests are better. But you tell me, is, is that the gauge that you use? Or do you even need a blood test if you're, let's say you're fully menopausal or postmenopausal, you will ergo have low I testosterone, no? Yes, you, you're not everyone. So some people, because you have some from the adrenals as well. So some, a few women will naturally run a higher testosterone. And so I think the, again, because I've been helping a few areas draw up pathways. And I think as a GP, I liked having the blood tests there for confidence and reassurance. And it can also help, again, when you're you're titrating the dose. So if the something called the free androgen index, the available testosterone is still low, you can then increase a little. I think further down the line, we may well rely more, once you're established and stable, we may well rely on symptoms much more. That you continue I realize we've covered a lot of ground without getting into sort of basics, but would would you, I mean, what would the level be? Because it's difficult to get an appointment now with COVID. Um, it's difficult to get blood tests. There's been a shortage of different vials and things like that. But if you've got an old record and maybe you have testosterone that has been taken along with your um, estrogen levels and progesterone, what sort of range would you be looking at where you would think, okay, I'm okay on that? Or could you ever say you're okay because you wouldn't have had the free androgen? You wouldn't know what's bioavailable. Well, this is this. We need so much more work in this because we don't know. Again, it's not something that's tested frequently. So I've had women ringing me in tears saying I've been told that my testosterone is normal. Well, it's generally only checked for in general practice in younger women when you're looking at a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is looking at a higher free androgen index. So as long as it's not that, then it's marked at normal. So it may be within the normal range, but it's incredibly low in range. And it, again, they very often will benefit from just moving it across to mid range, not talking about big jumps here. So again, we don't, we don't really have the data for what does a 30 year old run at? What does a 40 year old run at? What's the norm? There's, there's just, and in some areas, um, you need two blood tests to do this. And in some areas, the labs haven't been allowing one of the blood tests. So that 
another fight that has to be taken up. And is, so is really, anybody, sorry, go ahead. It really is. Again, it's the GPs need support on this before they will pick it up and run. We really need some, some backbone and some structure for them. So well, that is I, starting to happen. Yeah, well, you and Louise are having meetings, aren't you? You're leading the charge, mm -hmm. trying to get the powers that be to take a look at this because, and I know from, from me just, you know, running around, dropping your names to everyone, even I had a hospital appointment the other week and 43 year old nurse, and she mm -hmm. was working in plastics and we were talking and I mean, I end up talking to all these people. She said, oh, menopause and oh, and I, I probably just casually referenced, oh, you know, I'm menopause, I'm postmenopausal. So she was, oh, the menopause, I think I'm already started. And I said, well, you very mm -hmm. well could be. And mm -hmm. she said, oh, but my, my GP won't test. I said, no, you must insist. You must absolutely insist on a test. And I gave her your name and Louise's name and Nick Pane because I was really fortunate to live in West London. I'm just down the road from his clinic. So I have benefited from his advice. And he wanted to put me on testosterone a year ago. And I stupidly wasn't educated enough about it. I did literally think, honestly, Dr. Zoe, hair growth, Mm -hmm. and acne and I just uh, can't be dealing with that and because it was such a short appointment he just said well I would recommend you doing that and I just didn't know enough about it and I don't think you and Louise have put out all kinds of resources about this now and I wasn't aware and now I you know mm -hmm. I'd love to get back into his clinic and I'll try to and hopefully get it there and then it would still be as you say getting back to what you were saying earlier it would be one tenth of a tube of the male this yes. the thing, the so stuff they give to dose. the men. Yeah, tiny, tiny dose. But this, there is a company in Australia that has made something so a company specific called, for... Yeah, so there's a company called Androfem, and that's a female testosterone, and that's licensed in Australia, and hopefully um, will be licensed here by the end of next year. Oh, fantastic. Which, and why will it take that long? I always want everything to happen overnight. I know, I know. I'm so impatient. I've been harassing these poor CCGs when they're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. And saying, well, we need testosterone. And obviously, they've got a million and one other things that they need to focus on. But I think, well, we have to keep going with this because when is it going to happen otherwise? And they have well, been, been very patient with me, I have to say. Yeah. Well, I can imagine you just... You know, you need tenacity badges because <laughs> you, no, but I know too when I want something, I go for it. And mm. it's, you know, when you want something that is legitimately yours. And, mm. you know, I was going to do that journalist thing where I would ask everyone, I'd bring my microphone up. And I just thought, well, I'll just do it anyway without the microphone. I was at my aqua aerobics class and the women were range of ages and I just mm -hmm. was in the changing room. I said, so what do you guys think about testosterone? And they said, oh yeah, it's the male hormone. And I said, what if I told mm -hmm. you? And then I told them we make three to four times. And they said, oh, you're having a laugh. Forget it. Mm -hmm. That's not true. I said, and again, dropping, I feel like I'm your unappointed <laughs> ambassador you. running around sharing the news, but they were all, you know, varying degrees of skeptical, downright thinking mm -hmm. I'm making it up. And I said, no, honestly. And so I want, you were mentioning how people light up, but the larger point is we don't have enough people taking the safe, plant-based, protective, beneficial hormone replacement therapy that isn't from the 2002 Women's Health mm -hmm. Initiative that found there was a rise in breast cancer. And was it blood clots as well that were yeah, so that was the, the problem with that was the study was designed to look at cardiovascular disease. And so the cohorts weren't matched to look at breast cancer. So they should never have been used to look at breast cancer. So when you go back and extrapolate the data properly, there wasn't a significant increase. But that legacy has stayed on. Yeah. So th th there is, there's, there are still huge fears. There's still a lot of misinformation. But I think there's definitely a change because I'm getting messages. I obviously know a lot of GPs. I'm getting messages from GPs saying people are, are walking in with leaf leaflets from the website or emailing leaflets from the website and saying, I would like to try this. Yeah. And the course has done amazingly well. So there's a confidence in menopause course that's available on the menopause charity website for free. So well, it's, it's you guys that have started course. this up in, in recent months. Yes and you're going around across the UK. And can can people in other countries access this course yes. as well? 
they can yes yeah, so that's it's been released globally so in the uk i think it's it was over 14000 healthcare professionals had signed up to do it and it's wow. definitely definitely making a difference and that's so since when just in the last several months about 4 months i think Wow. And this is this is the other reason that I am on this mission with the testosterone because it shouldn't have to be the case that you have to ac access private care or fight, fight, fight to get this. When you're feeling so exhausted, it should be a normal consideration as part of HRT. And, and the HRT the itself needs also to be rebranded and re yes. and clarified and people need to be educated about it. well let's let's start with that i mean talk about the plant-based body identicals that we have now and how they're different from the products that were involved in this scary women's health I initiative know. from 2002 that's got everyone thinking if they take even a drop of hrt mm. they're going to get breast cancer the next day yeah it's it's awful it's it's still see so many women and I sort of talk them through because I never want anyone applying gel to their arms if they're not completely confident and want to do it. Mm. With several women, I'd have to give them the resources and say, no, I, you go away and read. And when you know everything about it, we've given you a lot of information today, but there's even more information that you can read through. And there's a fantastic book called Estrogen Matters that really digs down into all of this. And the so body identical just means that it has the same molecular structure as your body's own hormones. That's all it is. Whereas the older was sort of synthetic HRT was made up of various combinations of different estrogens and synthetic. And it's really to do with the synthetic progestogens that were in there. So they also have a slightly increased risk of clot. They don't have as good an effect on the cardiovascular system and they are associated in, in some of the other studies with a small increase in the risk of breast cancer. Whereas and can the, you quantify that risk for us? What, what are the numbers? So if you take a thousand women between the ages of 50 and 59, then the baseline risk for breast cancer is 23 in a thousand. This is taking the family history aside because that's a separate issue. The number of the, and then there are four increased cases with synthetic combined HRT. Now, just to put that in context, if you have two or more units of alcohol per day, which is the UK recommended limit, there are five extra cases. Right. Yet we don't see all these scary headlines plastered on bottles of Prosecco. Sorry, is someone Even making that, dinner behind you? Suddenly there's a lot of sorry. noise in the room. That's, are they starting a party the up? Oh, it's the dog. The dog, okay. the dog, the dog is yes. chowing down. I just thought I'd I'd pick that up because I thought people are going to be wondering yes. what's going on. Are the kids home? Um, so, so the risk now with the yam-based, highly regulated mm -hmm. product that is fully available through the national health system here is yes. what. So there's been a very good study that showed that the first five years use of this had no increased risk of breast cancer. And it hasn't been, so progesterone has been around for a long, long time, but they couldn't figure out how to get it into the micronized formula so that you're, we could actually use it. So it hasn't been around in that formula for a, as simulation for as long as the old synthetic ones. So obviously as it goes on, we'll get more data, but there's a, there's a fantastic podcast actually on the website by a um, chap called James, Professor James Simon. And that goes into the differences, and it's really important, the differences between progesterone and progestogen. Okay. Metabolically, they are very different. And this is the website, newsonhealth.co.uk. It's changed today, so it's balanced menopause today. They've combined together. But if you search Professor James Simon, he does a fantastic breakdown of the WHI trial. He's from the States. Um, does a fantastic breakdown of the WHI trial and which is the lecture he gave to American physicians. And there's also a really good half hour podcast on the differences between progesterone and progestogen. And I think there will be, I think progesterone is going to come into its own. And there's some, some I think there's some quite interesting research going on around progesterone because the, there's, and I can't remember where she's from, there's a professor that's actually looking, they think it will help with remyelination 
Wow. So she's going to do a study looking at multiple sclerosis, which is only just, just starting. So I think, as I say, progesterone hasn't fully, it's always sort of been dominated by estrogen. Um, yes. But I think progesterone is going to have its its field day. I think, I mean, both of them, progesterone and testosterone, I think are really, they just haven't been explored. The potential of, I mean, test, back to my favourite one, testosterone, the potential with this is vast. I, mean, I I always ask if women have been under chronic fatigue clinics for years and then we've looked at their testosterone, it's non-existent, we replace it, they start to function again. I always ask them to write to the consultant at the clinic to say, could you consider this with the other women that you're seeing? Because we have to get it everywhere and we need to get it fast. Well, right now and we've only got... It. We get the estrogel, the, you know, transdermal um, or patches, but it's transdermal. And mm -hmm. then we get the utrogestin. And I know in Europe, my Swiss Italian, she was a gynecological surgeon and she was, she was no nonsense. I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. I started to say, well, what about, she goes, no, 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 no. That's history. <laughs> this is now you're taking this. I mean, she, there were no options. She said, you need this. You need this for your bone health. You need this. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be something that we're going to mess around with. And she actually, you know, she went into all kinds of detail about people take this in Belgium, people take this in Italy, people take this all across Europe. I said, well, why haven't I heard about it? She goes, because you haven't been menopausal yet. So and you haven't been to me to know this. Yes. She says, I want to to just let you know this is safe. It's great. It's made from sweet potatoes, for heaven's sake. Yes. <laughs> she, she just said, honestly, I want to allay all of your fears, all of your qualms about this. And that's the thing, because I still get so many women just saying, no, 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 it's just too hairy, scary. There's no way I'm going near it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, remind us of the benefits of taking, you know, not people, people online, all kinds of people on, they just say, no, it's a transition. Menopause is fantastic. You need to find the spiritual side. And I just think, but you would take something that was plant-based for any other ailment. And yet you're not going to give yourself um, a buffer against osteoporosis by taking this safe treatment. And I think it, it is really multifaceted because I think, I mean, HRT is, is not a magic wand. It's fantastic and I'll come on to its benefits in a second. But this is the, again, it's a transition. It's a transitional time of life. And it is, it's a resetting, it's a stock take. And my view is very much that HRT can be a really good springboard to then start to look at what else needs a tidy up. Because if you're feeling better, then you're less likely to be using alcohol to get to sleep. If you're feeling yeah. better, you're more likely to be getting out and moving. If you're feeling better, your sleep is better, which has a huge impact on health. Your nutrition tends to be better because low estrogen can cause the most insane cravings. So it's a springboard and then it's a sort of a bit of a stock take on where do we go from here? So in terms of the physiological benefits, we know that it's brilliant for bones, it's brilliant for hearts, brilliant for brains, it can reduce insulin resistance. It, it, and again, it can help you function. So when you start to think that you have estrogen receptors in your, through your, throughout your entire body, it makes sense why things that people get dry eyes, burning mouth, joint pains, palpitations, gut disturbances, the vaginal symptoms, the mood symptoms, because estrogen supports your neurotransmitters. So it just makes sense that all of those things can be affected. And I think it was Lisa Mosconi, who's a fantastic neuroscientist, that said that estrogen is sort of the key that unlocks the pathways. So and, but it needs yeah. testosterone and progesterone to be working hand in glove with it, doesn't it? Because that's the thing right now, we've only got the two products that seem to be mm. dispensed a lot the plant-based two products only to 12 to 14% of the UK population that are willing and desperate to take HRT. Mm -hmm. So really testosterone would be the third leg of the stool. So as you said, have so. that. And, and what about, you know, vaginal atrophy and all mm -hmm. of the other things that, 
you know, a lot of women, because I've got my friends all taking this, and most of them would have been divorced by now if they didn't actually get on mm -hmm. estrogel and utrogestin because it has, they're reborn thanks to it. But, you know, now I'm telling them all your messages about the testosterone as well, you know, and that's the third leg to, to get that mm -hmm. going as well. And then you're giving yourself a full chance to have your memory back and have your full cognitive function. Yeah, yeah, and even going going back to the vaginal symptoms, we know that eighty percent of women will experience changes, and only ten percent will speak to a healthcare provider. And when you think of, I mean, it, it's again as a GP, I started to pick up on this as a fantastic book by Lewis called "Me and My Menopausal Vagina," which I read, and it was absolutely practice changing. I thought all of these urine samples were getting vast quantities of urine samples that are always negative. We're doing swabs that are always negative. It's all low vaginal estrogen. And that doesn't even really qualify as HRT because the absorption is so low. So it's a whole separate topic to look at that. Well, there are topical estrogens, but when you add in the testosterone, does mm -hmm. that help even more? Um, than, than just the topical because you can you can slather on it's I mean the brand name I'll say it Ovestin because mm -hmm. that is a topical estrogen and you can take that as well as the estrogel or the patches something transdermal yeah. and I know in Switzerland my Swiss gynae she was saying she didn't want me to take it orally the utrogestin she said mm -hmm. you must take this vaginally because then it doesn't go through your system it doesn't mess up your liver you'll get it'll be more efficacious that way is is that the way you prescribe it as well or does it depend no, on the we, person? we tend to there's more there is more data for taking it orally and taking it orally actually has therapeutic benefits because it acts on your GABA receptors so in a lot of people it helps with sleep and anxiety so people can use it vaginally off license if they're intolerant um, but most of the data is for oral how would you know you're intolerant Oh, you know. <laughs> what would your symptoms be of, of an intolerance? <laughs> you turn into a horrible person. Um, no, it's that sort of premenstrual crankiness very often. Um, it can, it can. if you are intolerant, it you start to dread if you're on a cyclical regime where you, it's on and off. It doesn't happen so much with the continuous regimes. So if women have stopped their periods and they're on an everyday regime, yeah. Progesterone effects are very often due to trans to sort of fluctuations rather than the progesterone. So progesterone intolerance is is not so much the progesterone, it's the receptors that they don't cuddle up as well. Okay. So if you experience that, it's normally on a cyclical regime, and that's when some women will use it vaginally off license. Well, it's funny because that's what she recommended for me, and she only wanted three to three to four times a week, not every night, to the, to match the estrogel. So, I think again, there's there's been so there are the generally fixed regimes for womb lining change, and I think though there was a bit of a hang up around progesterone following on from the progestogen impact. And that's starting to change, as I say, I think there are, I think progesterone will come into its own and there'll be a lot more research on that coming through. Yeah. And in terms of, I mean, as I say, with things like sex drive, I would, testosterone is your reconnecting hormone. So I've had lots of people say it just, I, it's gone. I just can't, I love my partner very much but sex just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like anything. And it yeah. just reconnects, reconnects brains, reconnects confidence, motivation, sex drive. And you only have to take a smidge to yeah. reclaim the hormone that you lost. And does it do like estrogen and progesterone, this, the cliff dive? You know, with does men, it... it's, it's gradual, isn't it? You know, from mm. 50s all the way to 80s, it's just a steady decline. Yeah. Whereas with us, it is that swan dive off a cliff, which is yeah. why it has such horrific impact. So your testosterone tends to do a steady dribble, I would say, rather than the big up and down of estrogen and the, the sort of dip in progesterone. So I think that's why I had a, a wonderful lady who described it as an insidious creep, which I think is fantastic because <laughs> you just get a little bit more tired and you get a little bit more forgetful and you just sort of it creeps along and it's only when you fill in a symptom checker or, or speak to somebody and realize that actually these were all symptoms of low hormones and then it wow. comes together and I think that's often the case that you sort of look back a few years and think 
what happened. I used to be able to drive my car. I used to be able to walk up that hill. And I just really don't have the mental energy, physical energy for any of this now. But it's the lack of motivation when I talk to a lot of my friends. Now that they're just on the two, like me, without the third mm -hmm. leg of that stool, yes. which um, yes. we're all going to be chasing, um, thanks to you and to Louise. <laughs> um, you know, it's the lack of motivation. You, mm -hmm. you know, you deal with the initial, oh my God, I've been hit by a juggernaut. Mm -hmm. How, why do I feel like this? I'm anxious, I can't sleep, all the rest. I never had any vasomotor stuff. I never, mm -hmm. I don't think I've had a quarter of a hot flash ever. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it was just, you know, the bitchiness and, mm -hmm. and the lack of sleep, you know, did such yes, a number. Yes, yes, you yes. cannot function, do a 12 no, hour shift, awful. stressful work, or even just be a, a human subsisting, mm -hmm. you need mm -hmm. your sleep. And I think, um, you know, all of us, we, we just don't realize that all of the help is there. Because I still find when I go on Twitter, there are some people that are just going, oh, just suffer long. We've got to stop medicalizing this. Mm -hmm. And I just think, wow, you could have 40 more years of life. Mm -hmm. And you really want to have to replace your hip instead of take something plant-based that's going to protect your bones? And I think that's, I mean, it's, it's every person has to make their decision. But it's, I would always say to people, make your decision based on evidence not on newspaper headlines and that's well, who where can't take it who can't take it what there would are, be the specific conditions that would so there are there are really it's it's there are women who've had a hormone receptor positive breast cancer and even with that so the nice guidelines are that they have if they have really severe symptoms it can be considered so again you wouldn't be racing to do that very early on in treatment but we speak to a lot of women who either i mean unfortunately we have a an emergency appointment nearly every day at the clinic for women who are suicidal because of menopausal symptoms oh, now again so with a if it, with a breast cancer diagnosis there are it's quite a it is it's a very in-depth consultation nothing's decided on that day so it's looking at quality of life have alternatives been tried what was the cancer how big was it staging all of those sorts of things how long ago was it and again it's a different risks benefits consultation but even the data with that has not confirmed so there were three big studies and it hasn't confirmed any increased risk post an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer we need a lot really? more data hmm. yeah. what well, do you so think I mean that's that's quite surprising. Yeah, and, there's a, there's and a lot wonderful, more that needs really. To be done. Hmm. Yeah, I mean I think. Are you taking testosterone as well? Of course I am. As <laughs> of course you are. Yeah, and I don't see any extra hair growth. No beards. There. No beards. No, mine was again. It was I just couldn't believe that um, it could be such so in, pervasive. It was so mine. The brain fog was horrific. Um, I had to have time off work. I've never had time off work in 20 years because I just could not do you. I mean, you've got an appointments every seven to 10 minutes. You need to be on it and you're making big decisions. And I just could not dredge that information. It was, and then I didn't even realize that I was sighing before I walked up the stairs. Oh my word. And I did a post about the stairs of Everest. And it was only when I was back up and running and in normal range again and that I realized how he it to be. And this is why I want this to be available to anyone who would like to explore it. Do you think there's a role and a way forward? Because I think, you know, we've mythologized testing and mm -hmm. all of this. And I mean, do we have to become educated self-experimenters, you know, to, to figure out, to biohack ourselves? And, if it doesn't work, then we'll try something else. And this is, the, yeah, I think this is the thing. I mean, we tend to look at it as a six month trial. And part of that is because of the barriers at the moment, then very often if women want to stay on it, they have to stay under the clinic and that's a private clinic. So we do try and pass this back to GPs, but the GPs are limited by the red tape. <laughs> so. Oh, do you know every podcast this is happening? This is smudge. Oh. Really hogging oh. the shot. 
Loves her camera time. <laughs> yes, yes darling. Love you too. Oh, Arlo and her, they're becoming mainstays of every podcast I do. Oh, but um, anyway, they get so their no, walk on. We don't have our medicine tin is appalling. We have, sort of, I think, some 20 year old antibiotics. Um, but I, I mean, I said to somebody I was chatting with a, um, a psychologist friend of mine about the whole is this medicalized, medicalizing the menopause? And I said, I don't feel medicalized, I just feel like me. There's been lots of other things that I've had to address alongside HRT, but I don't, I don't feel, I just feel like me again. Well, when this was ignored by medical researchers, we didn't live long past the menopause. That was sort of the signal of it. And we'd have a few, few years with our grandkids and that would be it. You know, now we're living so much longer. We deserve to have a quality of life. We deserve mm -hmm. to have a super hot sex life. We deserve to have brain cognition that is mm. hyperdrive. You know, mm. there is no reason at all that we should be withdrawing and retiring mm. to the sidelines just for lack of a few hormones that are our hormones. I just they find it yes. astonishing, you know, and I don't know, I, I just would hope you know, if there's someone that is like the Wizard of Oz <laughs> in these these medical decision making bodies, surely when they hear you and Louise as the tag team putting all this information in their ears, you know, we just need one person who has the power to say, OK, we're going to change things. There will be a standard of care that starts from now on. All GPs will be able to dispense this. All GPs will have your info sheets. I'm just running too fast, aren't I? It is, yeah, it is. It's, it's really frustrating, and this is okay. And again, when I do a post on social media, I, I, it it is a slow process, but we've made a lot of progress over this year. So Louise has been working with NHS England, um, so again, the, the the bigger body. So that that's been really. Hopefully, that will sort of drive things forward. Both of us have been working with different companies to try and get a testosterone product licensed for women in the UK. And I think it is gathering momentum now that people are starting to know about it, starting to recognize that this could be, because the symptoms can be really terrifying. Again, we get a lot of people that think they've got early dementia with this. It's not just little symptoms. And so even just knowing that there's possibly a cause for those. And again, it just means that they've then got the impetus to get referred to an NHS menopause clinic. And I did a little survey the other day and a um, load of people emailed back in, which was great. And that showed that actually, if women raise the issue of testosterone in an NHS menopause clinic, it's discussed. And that 75% of doctors, once they've got those guidelines and that framework there, so 75% of those GPs were then happy to continue prescribing. It just needs the dots joining up the great big pen. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I just hail, all hail you and Louise for doing this because it's so necessary because this is 51% of the population. And it's not just that, it's everyone because husbands, children, you know, we need all women to be operating at their optimum. You know, we don't need the workforce. Them. Yeah, the workforce, home, everything. You know, I just think there, and I don't say it's deliberate, but I think if we look at the history of medical research where women were just considered the same as men. Look at that, you know, that Babylon app, um, mm -hmm. the information fed in. You know, we, we've just been given short shrift throughout. Yeah. And we now, we now have you leading the charge and everybody falling in it. Maybe it'll be like some of the, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in the black hole of nutrition. You can reverse yes. diabetes. You can put that into remission by going slow and low on the carbs. I've had Dr. Mm -hmm. David Unwin and his wife, Jen on, and, mm -hmm. you know, giving up sugar. And you mentioned a role for testosterone with insulin resistance. Please, please give me more on that. So that's more, um, there's more data with that with estrogen that can um so again what you tend to find with so a couple of different factors within um estrogen so it generally so it will decrease insulin resistance it helps with your sleep pattern which also helps with that because it helps with the cortisol and the insulin so you tend to find that when it's replaced again you don't have these horrible sugar cravings so it's easier to then follow the nutrition plans by people like dr unwin Mm -hmm. to get everything back on track again. 
So again, Fantastic. I think there is some data for testosterone with insulin resistance, but we need we need so much more data with it and its potential. Well, how close do you think we are? You know, if women keep bugging their GPs for this mm -hmm. and more and more and more, and there's a wave and grassroots momentum to this, how soon do you think we are to seeing some systemic change? I would hope, I mean, I would say to people in the clinic, I would hope within the next couple of years that I should be able to pass the majority of this prescribing back to GPs and GPs be supported to do so. I, really I mean, that's a, that that's, that's a point because you now work for a private clinic because mm -hmm. you can you can have more of an impact because you can call your own shots and you can help all the women that come to you, but you do want to hand it back to within the NHS. Mm -hmm. So every woman can avail themselves of, of this these quality of life treatments or whatever else. I mean, I don't know what you feel about about alternatives. Are there women out there who simply will never be able to to take hormone replacement therapy? It's very, very few. And I think it's that whole thing. I mean, women who choose not to and even well, women on H, all women at this stage, we all need to be looking at bones, hearts, brains, health. And that's not just HRT. It's so I'm saying it's a, a, a big stock take and a big cleanup. Yeah. Because again, um, Dr. Moscone posted recently that what we're doing now has an impact on our brains in 20 years time. It's that stock taking time. And you know, the, the jumpers that have the winging it across them, I think we should have a menopause one that says unwinging it because it's time to really start to own our lifestyle and clean it all up. Yeah, well, this is where it gels nicely. It's funny, the XX Brain author, Dr. Moscone, she's, we've been chasing each other for about a year. So hopefully I'll get her on at some point. I've got her book, I've read it. So I mean, it's all, it's all fascinating. And I do feel there's this groundswell, you know, again, you and Louise and others, Liz Earle, she's doing a lot of podcasts mm -hmm. on it. And she's, she's one of your, um, your frontline people. Um, very influential yeah, so woman. Yeah, she's an ambassador for the charity, I think. Yeah, and you've you've got the menopause charity and the balancemenopause.com, is it, or .co.uk? I think it's .com. It's only been launched today. So I, I did write it down somewhere, but I can't remember where I put it. <laughs> and there will be loads of resources there. Now, I wanted to ask you one more thing because I don't know where I heard it, but apparently testosterone can be suppressed I'm thinking the women in their 20s, even late teens, 20s, 30s, mm -hmm. who are on oral contraception. Mm -hmm. is, is, is that true? Yeah, so we tend to, if women are on, um, again, with oral HRT, it can suppress it because of the effect on the sex hormone binding globulin. So that's a, a starting point. And then um, we tend to move them over to the transdermal because that will automatically release some of the testosterone. So, yes. So it'll make it more bioavailable. Yeah. It, it can actually yeah. shuttle around to the receptors. Yes, yes, and find the right ones, yeah. Okay, I mean, what, what advice would you give to women who are in their late 30s? I mean, I realize it can happen perimenopause at mm -hmm. any age and ovarian, POI, ovarian insufficiency, all of that. But generally, if, if women in their late 30s, early 40s think that they're hitting perimenopause, what advice mm -hmm. would you give them I think it's it's again it's sort of don't be frightened of it it's a it's another stage it's another transition it can be um i think the more you know about it if you know about it then you can when the symptoms come along to some extent you can think right okay that that anxiety that waking in the morning is because my estrogen has dropped down and the sympathetic nervous system is ramping up and i know what's causing that i think the, the knowledge is the thing that there are so many books out there to start reading about, start learning about, having this curiosity, just observing yourself again. Yeah. So I read somewhere that the last time females are as connected to themselves is when they're age nine. And then you get everyone and society telling you who you are, what to eat, what to do. And then menopause is the time where you then start, it makes you reconnect again. Right. And I believe that looking at and speaking to people that come through. It has a way of, it's it sort of, it, it, again, it finds the true self again. So we see so many people that change their careers because they're not finding that investment the same in what they're, in, in what they're doing. There's, 
there's a, a real wisdom that comes with it. So it no, absolutely. Be. And for men too, though, you know, this is mm -hmm. this is core material for the big middle because there is that midlife shift. And for mm -hmm. us, menopause is a, is a huge part of it. But in mm -hmm. general, in the midlife, you know, I had Jonathan Rausch, the author, author of The Happiness Curve on, and mm -hmm. there have been so many studies, dozens of so many studies um, on on what happens to you. And you mm -hmm. do have a mind shift and mm. you want a more purposeful life, you want to shake things up, and mm. you do have to, though, pay more attention to your physiology and yes. your neurology, don't you? Yeah. It, and this is where it dovetails so nicely with the work of David Unwin and some yes. of the other illustrious people that I've had on the podcast. You know, you've got to be mindful of insulin resistance if you don't want yeah. diabetes. And you've got to recognize that you might well be insulin resistant if you've had the standard American diet, the been doing mm -hmm. the eat well guide here in the UK and loading up your plate with carbs mm -hmm. instead of prioritizing mm -hmm. protein. I mean, they're, you know, the this is when the rubber hits the road, more or less, yes. because your, yes. your, your body becomes much more so rambunctious. Yes, yeah, so it's with all those sorts of things, you can actually start preparing for it and you can start trying to cut down the alcohol a little bit, you can start looking after your bones and increasing the exercise because all of these things help. And they may well help with the early symptoms. They help with the anxiety, they help with the hot flushes, they help with the joint pains and they should dovetail alongside. So I think it, it, it is that thing of, it is going to happen and there's no point trying to ignore it. It is going to happen. We're all going to go through it at some point. Yeah. The more that you know about it, you've got your options to decide on your treatment pathway. You've got your options to decide on your lifestyle pathway. And hopefully that should help it to make it a little bit more of a smoother transition. Because yeah, it's absolutely. interesting. It's fascinating. I just find it all incredibly fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I guess, though, the thing is, too, if you're if you know your late 30s and early 40s and you can't be thinking every every fight with your kid or your husband is, you know, or every bit, every time you have a bit of a low mood, it's no, it's mm -hmm. not menopause. It's just life. And you probably got had a terrible night's sleep or something. You know, it's not it's not all about this, but you have to keep it in mind because it just, is coming. Yeah, so if those things are creeping in a little bit more and you just you're just feeling not quite right and that's where the app comes in because you can start to track your symptoms and just see what's happening you can track your periods and see what's happening with them so it just gives you an idea because again some of them they can be here one day they've gone the next and you just think well i can't be having it um but if as you say the sort of sleep quality if you realize that that has really started to decrease down and you've got some joint pains and you're getting vaginal symptoms. It's the linking, I think. And that's why these the, the app is so good because it will link the symptoms together. So it's not isolated features. And then you can start to think, oh, could my estrogen or progesterone be starting to drop down a little? And then yeah. I can start reading around my options. So the app is balance. And is mm -hmm. it available then through the Apple Store and Google and, and, or, yes. and on your website? So balance, menopause? Balance Menopause, I think it's number one on the Apple chart today, which is great. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, World yes, that's global. As, I know, that's global as well. So, that's fabulous. Oh, that's um, brilliant. There's lots of information out there. And we, we get messages worldwide, which is great that people have downloaded information and taken it to their healthcare provider um, and been able to get onto the HRT that they've chosen to, to yeah. use. Well, I know I was asking you about um, comparative global figures, you know, and I did do a bit of a Jill journalist routine in preparation to talk Thank with you. Thank you. And I, I, I wrote to Nick Panay, Mr. Menopause here. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, I, I'd already said I was lucky enough to be in his clinic and he was so kind. And I said, you know, where is the take up greatest? You know, what are mm. we've got 12 to 14 percent. What is it like in the United States? What is it like in Saudi Arabia? What is it like all around? And he said, I really don't know. I really can't say. He said, but honestly, great idea if you talk to Bessan International. And I had no idea. I knew that they made estrogel one of mm -hmm. the most popular transdermals, and then there's Sandrina, and you could probably run down some of the other brand names because I only kind of know the two that I use. Mm -hmm. um, but I had no idea that they also make utrogestin. Yes. So they must be making some testosterone. They must, must have a big yam factory somewhere. No, they don't at the moment. This is what we're working on. I just, 
unbelievable if you're mm. listening yeah and i did get yeah get it going get the factory fired up because i did talk to their you know i wrote several emails and i got back several kind of oh we really don't know we can't divulge that information you mm. know in terms of their sales globally mm. because i can only just go back to my gynecological surgeon and she whoops sorry hitting the microphone and she she actually just said you know susan every woman you see on the street who is menopausal is taking this perimenopausal menopausal postmenopausal and there's a the point what mm. about i'm going to declare right now my views on it what about this rubbish that you have to stop after five years after 10 years because i'm never stopping no i think this is the um Again, so it, it should ideally, and it's tricky at the moment with the situation in general practice, but ideally should have a yearly review. And that's to assess whether the benefits continue to outweigh the risks. But when you're looking at the body identical HRT, that generally is the case and women can stay on it as long as they like. I mean, do you know, do you have uh, patients that are 70s, 80s on it? Oh yes, and they're fabulous. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Quality yes, of yeah. life? Wonderful. Absolutely. And the other thing that's very striking is is how few medications they're on. So you know, as a GP, I would have often expected a sort of seventy-year-old to be on five, six medications for various ailments. And these women come to the clinic and you sort of say, "What's your what are your other medications?" Nothing. And you just wow. think, "How is that?" And all of the women suffering from fibromyalgia and all of these sort of nebulous things. Imagine mm. how they could be helped. I mean, there's a real economic side to this, isn't mm -hmm. there? I mean, if we want to look at, at prevention of mm. having all kinds of people in the hospital, here's the other cat. Has he come in the frame yet? Yes. <laughs> so distracting. Well, doctor, I think we've, we've pretty much covered everything. Have you got anything else you want to add? No, I just think, I mean, you're all, it's, 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 we couldn't do this without everyone out there. And I think this is the thing is, is just keep talking and just keep sharing information. And you may well have friends that are skeptical, but then they may go away and have a little look at the app and then they'll start reading because it will link them into articles. So I think this is the thing it is, it's just getting the information out there and again eventually these these dots will we'll get this great big marker pen and they will all join up it is it is happening oh, just great. one more little tiny thing um diane danzibrink who runs the menopause support.co.uk website has been running a campaign for the last three years called make menopause matter yeah and she's really going to try and get it or trying to get it to 200,000 signatures this week. Yes. So if listeners could please, please, please sign that. It means we can get the legislation. We've got the backing with that. And hopefully that will help when they are taking it to Parliament later this month. Yeah, absolutely. And on October 29th, that's a, a red marker day too. What's yes. happening then? So I think um, it's Carolyn Harris has been amazing with all of this and she's taking her bill to Parliament. So that's looking at um, one of the things would be free HRT prescriptions, which would be incredible. Yeah, it really would, so, because it, what is it? It's already fully available and free in Wales, but not in Wales, England. Yeah, not in England. And again, it's that thing of because it's often it's two hormones, so you're paying the cost of two prescriptions. And the area I worked in, again, women on low income just couldn't, felt that they couldn't justify that cost to feel well. And that shouldn't be happening. No. There's a lot all. going on. Yeah, there is. is. And you, I feel the groundswell, even just speaking mm -hmm. with you. There's so many things happen. And if more and more women who are on the two legs of the HRT uh, stool. You'll get the third, uh, yeah, third leg of the start, stool. Yeah, start, <laughs> the stool. Start demanding it. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. With bags of energy and determination, you are opening closed minds and clearing the way for more midlife women to reclaim their testosterone, their own hormone, which is mm. the biggest, most astonishing aspect of all of this. I mean, we just want to shout it out from the rooftops. Mm. You know, men get Viagra, men can go, they can get mm -hmm. over, over the counter, can't counter. they? It's, yeah. it's, it's quite incredible. So yeah, we need our own female specific one. Okay. Huge thanks, Dr. Zoe, <laughs> for coming on The Big Middle and sharing all with us. It's lovely to be here. <laughs>